Good evening. I'm Chris Oppie, professor of history at UMass Amherst, director of the Ellsberg Initiative for Peace and Democracy, and co-chair of this year's Feinberg series. It is my honor to welcome you to tonight's Feinberg series panel on the successes, failures, and legacies of the Vietnam era anti-war movement. We are broadcasting from the campus of the University of Massachusetts Amherst, which was founded and built on the unceded homelands of the Pukumtik Nation on the land of the Norotig community and made possible through the Morrill Land Grant Act, which sold portions of land from 82 native nations to fund the building of land grant universities, including UMass Amherst. We begin with this acknowledgement. This event is presented by the Feinberg Family Distinguished Lecture Series, offered every other year by the Department of History at UMass Amherst. Each Feinberg series focuses on a, a big issue with deep historical roots and profound relevance to the present. Titled Confronting Empire, this year's series is exploring global histories of US imperialism and anti-imperialist resistance. This series covers a vast history of US empire from its roots as a settler colonial state to overseas expansion to the wars of the 21st century. I encourage you to visit the Feinberg series website to learn more. There you can also view recordings of past events and register for future events. You can find more information about these offerings in the chat box, along with information on how to turn on the live closed camp captioning and how to listen to tonight's event in Spanish. If you're attending this event as a part of a class, you'll also want to look to the chat box for a link to our sign-in sheet. Before we begin, I'd like to thank the more than three dozen university and community partners who collaborated with the UMass Amherst History Department to co-present this series, including the Ellsberg Initiative for Peace and Democracy. I also wanna thank the uh, large team of students, faculty and staff whose collaborative efforts brought this series to fruition. And Kenneth R. Feinberg and Associates, whose generosity makes this series possible. After the presentations, we are looking forward to a lively Q&A session. We will periodically drop a link to the Q&A form into the chat box. As you listen to the presenters, please use the form to submit your question when you think of it. No need to wait until the end to submit. We will assemble the questions backstage as we prepare for the Q&A. It is now my honor to introduce our moderator, the Peabody award-winning filmmaker, Judith Elric, co-director and producer of The Most Dangerous Man in America, Daniel Ellsberg and the Pentagon Papers. Her most recent documentary, The Boys Who Said No, tells the story of a mass movement of draft resistors who chose conscience over killing in the Vietnam War. We would like to show a short uh, trailer for that film. We are going to win. I'm convinced that it is one of the most unjust wars that has ever been fought in the history of the world. The war they were asking us to fight and it bore no resemblance to what I thought Americans were supposed to do. Evil is a participatory phenomenon, and it counts on participation in order to be successful. And the first option you have is withdrawing your participation. And from there, it's all liberation, whatever the cost. The census had tended to be two and a half years, and he gave me three. These are our cards. You have our names. Joe Stewart, New York. Come arrest us. We ourselves actually could take the step that would bring this war to an end by refusing to go, just refusing to cooperate. And if you want to put me in jail, then you go ahead and put me in jail. And that, of course, is what they did. Hell no, we won't go. I just don't think I should go 10,000 miles from here and shoot some black people that never called me nigger. This was not a popular position in greater America. The most encouraging thing is when a young man says no to Uncle Sam and, and will take the jail sentence. Did you have any final things to say to David before they took him away that you yeah, can tell us? Yeah, I said us? I love you. 
The idea of political nonviolence, that's the gift of the 20th century to the world. And we must continue to follow the dictates of our conscience, even if that means breaking unjust laws. My name's Rich Profumo, and I just refused induction. And what we say to our brothers around this country is a very simple word. That word is resist. <laughs> Hello, so pleased to be here with you today and with this incredible group of people who are so knowledgeable on the subject, one I've been immersed in for many years myself as a filmmaker. Um, this latest film is truly um, a look at the resistance movement during the Vietnam War and um, sort of a call for activism and really ends on the note of how movements built on previous movements. And I think that's something that I hope we can talk about a little bit tonight, but also everyone's got so much expertise in their particular area. I'd really like to hear from <clears throat> all of you. Um, and uh, I, we're gonna start out, well, I, you know, the whole subject of this tonight is uh, tonight, today in California where I am, um, is really about the, the legacy the, of the Vietnam War. And I think that, um, our, well, both the legacy and the conduct and conclusion of the Vietnam War. But I, we're gonna start with Bill um, H.D. Earhart, who is a poet as well as a Vietnam vet and, a, and has um, done a lot of really wonderful writing on the subject. And um, maybe he'll honor us with a poem to start with, which is um, called Guns, if you want to. Um, sure. Okay. Um, so, am I going to be this little box at the top? There we go. <laughs> little box at the top. I'll do this yeah. at the end, but I'll do it at the beginning. Uh, it's called Guns. Again, we pass that field green artillery piece squatting by the Legion Post on Chelton Avenue. Its ugly little pointed snout ranged against my daughter's school. Did you ever use a gun like that? My daughter asks, and I say no, but others did. I used a smaller gun, a rifle. She knows I've been to war. That's dumb, she says. And I say yes, and nod because it was, and nod again because she doesn't know. How do you tell a four-year-old what steel can do to flesh? How vivid do you dare to get? How explain a world where men kill other men deliberately and call it love of country? Just 18, I killed a 10-year-old. I didn't know. He spins across the marketplace, all shattered eyes, all arms and legs. Do I tell her that? Not yet. Though one day I will have no choice except to tell her or to send her into the world wide-eyed and ignorant. The boy spins across the years till he lands in a war in another place where yet another generation is rudely about to discover what their fathers never told them. Bill, I didn't introduce you properly. You are a poet and I'm really, thank you so much for reading that beautiful poem and beautiful upsetting and beautiful poem. Um, but you also have a PhD from the University of Wales at Swansea, and you're a retired master teacher of English and history. And I love the title of your book, Winning Hearts and Minds, War Poems. And you've been, um, yeah, just thank you for being with us. And go ahead and tell us, um, yeah. Well, are you going to ask me that question that I'm supposed to answer? Go ahead and answer it. <laughs> What question would you like to right, I'll ask? I'll ask it myself here. No, um, here. It says, says, how and why did your views of the war change so dramatically from being a fervent supporter of Vietnam War hawk Barry Goldwater in 1964 to joining Vietnam veterans against the war when you returned from your tour as a Marine sergeant in Vietnam? Yes, that's a good question. 
Yeah, well, also, now you have to understand, um, I, I've written a three book memoir trilogy. Um, I've spent 15 years and 700 printed pages trying to answer that question. And I'm supposed to do it now in actually, because we that 10 minutes comes out of my poem, um, I got seven and a half minutes. You're gonna get the Reader's Digest version of my answer. I grew up in a small town in uh, rural Pennsylvania. It was uh, solidly white Christian. We had two Jewish families in a town of 5,000. There was one black kid in my graduating high school class of 276. Memorial Day Parade was a big deal. Um, I grew up uh, in the shadow of you know, the, the Hungarian revolt, the Berlin Wall, the, uh, the Kita Shushev banging his shoe. You know, I was, I was, the Russians were out to get us. I also grew up in the shadow of the John Wayne movies and all that stuff. And when Lyndon Johnson said, uh, you know, if we do not stop the communists in Vietnam, we will one day have to fight them on the sands of Waikiki. Well, that sounded serious to me. And I had two older brothers who were both in college. Um, I decided I would defer college and I enlisted in the Marines when I was 17. I was very much doing what John Kennedy told me I should do, ask not what your country can do for you. Uh, I was going to go over and save the Vietnamese from the communists and ultimately save my mother, my country from the communists. Um, I got to Vietnam in February of 67. I was 18 at that point. And within a, within a couple of days, things started getting really crazy. I, I witnessed Marines uh, badly abusing civi Vietnamese civilians. Um, over the next few months, I witnessed and participated in stuff that was just mind boggling. I, I could not make sense of what was going on. I realized by uh, early summer of 1967 that I did not know what was going on. I had no idea how to figure this out. It was totally crazy. It wasn't what I'd been told by Lyndon Johnson and Time Magazine and my high school teachers, and I didn't wanna die here. And I spent the next eight months, seven, eight months, simply trying to stay alive long enough to get the heck out of Vietnam. Uh, I did that. I had another year to do in the Marines, uh, and then I started college. Um, and uh, and all that time, I'm I'm telling myself, I mean, I don't know what's going on in Vietnam. You can't get away from the war. It's everywhere. It's on TV. It's in every newspaper. But it's not my problem anymore. I'm, I got all 10 fingers and all 10 toes, and, and I'm out of it. Ain't my problem. Meanwhile, I'm engaged in incredibly self-destructive behavior. Um, finally, in the spring of, of uh, 1970, the Ohio National Guard murdered those kids at Kent State. Um, and that one finally, that, that was a smack in the face for me. Um, I found myself thinking it's not enough to send us halfway around the world to die. Now they're killing us in the streets of our own country. And I set out to end the war. But I believed at that point that um, the the war was, uh, you know, the Americans, we meant well. It's like that Burns and Nove thing starts out with the honorable men who they're bullshit. Anyway, I thought, you know, America's fallen off the track somehow. If we could just get the engine back on the track, we'll be, we'll be okay. We really tried to do the right thing. Um, and I continued to believe that while speaking out against the war until June of 1971. <laughs> And Dan Ellsberg turns the Pentagon Papers out into the public, and I started reading those things. And when I read those, it, it Dan already knows this. They it changed my life forever, permanently. I realized this was not a mistake. The U.S. government and four presidents had been lying to the American people for 25 years. Uh, it wasn't about freedom or democracy. They didn't give a rat's ass about me or my buddies that they were sending over there to die. And I got really, really angry. And I've pretty much been angry ever since. Um, I think, how how am I doing here? Uh, I think I got seven minutes. Um, I would have been perfectly happy to let, to let uh, you know, once we got out of Vietnam and ended it, that'd be fine. But But we didn't learn the right lessons.
Um, I often hear people say, we didn't learn anything from Vietnam. Look at, yeah, we did, the wrong people learned the wrong lessons. Um, what, what the people who run the show from Washington, uh, what they learned is that the American people will tolerate anything so long as it's not their kids coming home in body bags. Um, but they couldn't do anything about that with Vietnam. It was too late. But that's the way Reagan fought his wars against the peasants of Central America. It is the way that we fought our wars in Iraq, in Afghanistan. Uh, American kids are basically not the ones coming home dead. And what happens with our tax dollars, big deal. I think one of the worst, the worst consequence of the Vietnam War was um, in an odd sort of way prompted by the anti-war movement. The U.S. government didn't want another anti-war movement, and so they created this so-called volunteer military, uh, which is really an economic draft. A tiny percentage of Americans bear the blood price of American foreign policy. And meanwhile, the, 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 um, the consequences of American foreign policy have been uh, completely removed from American domestic politics. I mean, where was the anti-war movement? 20 years in Afghanistan? Hell, we had an anti-war movement in Vietnam after like four or five years. Um, but most Americans don't, their kids don't ever have to go in the military. Um, anyway, you know what? I think, I think I'm up to like seven and a half or eight minutes or something like that. Is it, Judith, is there anything else? I'm, I'm rambling. I can, I can keep you here forever. I means nothing to me. What? What what are we talking about here? Well, you know, I would just like to hear what inspired you to become a writer and a poet and how that relates to who you were then and who you are now. Um, uh, good question. You know, the Vietnam War did not make me a writer. Um, I actually was writing on my own initiative uh, from the time I was 15. Uh, I wasn't going to be the star of the football team or anything like that, but I could attract some attention with the girls by writing poetry. Um, and uh, certainly the Vietnam War gave me a lot to write about. But even when I was writing about the war most intensely, I was still writing brokenhearted love poems and poems about geese in the autumn. Um, I wish that I could be like play the guitar like Bruce Springsteen and fill Yankee Stadium with 70,000 screaming fans. Unfortunately, I, I don't know how to play a guitar. I can't do anything except somehow push words across the page. I, I, don't, I can't really explain why. Um, I thought it was pretty cool in high school that we were reading all these dead white guys. And unfortunately, they were dead white guys, but they were pretty good writers. Um, and but they had cheated death, you know that they had made themselves immortal, and that, that was a cool idea too when I was a high school kid. So I've been writing since I was fifteen. What would you, what would you like to be remembered for as a writer, and as a, and what do you think? What's the lesson about Vietnam you hope you've conveyed through your writing? My my problem with uh, what I'd like to be remembered by as a writer is to not be remembered as a Vietnam War writer. I'm a writer who went to Vietnam, yep. um, and three quarters of my poems have nothing to do with war. Uh, but uh, what I want to learn about the war, I guess what I would say to all of the kids I've taught over the years, you know, question everything, yeah. question authority. Don't believe what the power brokers want you to believe. Um, yeah, who was it? Uh, uh, not I.F. Stone, or was it I.F. Stone, who said uh, all governments are made up of liars and nothing they say should be believed. I guess that's really what what it comes down to. <laughs> Thank I'm you. sure I'm over my 10 minutes by now. I, I Whatever you took was well worth the time. I really appreciate it. And thank you for being with us. Um, and we'll come back to you later. But I, I did it. Terrible job introducing everyone. And when you mentioned Dan Ellsberg, I thought everybody else didn't see all those pictures up before. And Dan Ellsberg was with us and will be with us later and has been a huge influence in my life. But also, um, we've got several other people with us today and um, Carolyn Eisenberg and uh, the next, I think that's it besides Dan, um, the next person who's going to come to speak with us is a um, 
uh, of a younger generation, which is great um, to have someone younger here with us. She, her name is, uh, sorry, her name is, sorry, no, no yet, hmm? No yet when, sorry, I just lost, I lost that. No yet when, she's a scholar of the Vietnamese transnational anti-war movement, which included many young Vietnamese from South Vietnam, who also once supported the US mission in Vietnam. What were some of the reasons that changed their minds about the war? I, I think it's very interesting that I've done a lot of work on this period and I wasn't all that aware that there was actually an anti-war movement in Vietnam. And I'd really like to hear more about that. And um, I'm looking forward to what you have to say. And uh, she's a scholar who teaches now at um, University of um, Southern South Alaska, is that right? And um, we're really happy to have- Alaska her. Southeast. Alaska Southeast, sorry. I just put my notes, I've gotten just too many notes here. Um, yes, and um, I'd love to hear what you have to say about that. And I know you have a new book that's coming out and I'd like to hear a bit about your new book and what, you're, what you have to say about that, um, the Vietnamese part of the anti-Vietnam War because we don't hear enough about that. And it's a very, very, very interesting subject to me. And thank you for joining us from, from your, <laughs> from Vietnam <Yeah>. and Alaska, <laughs> visually thank Vietnam. You. Yeah. And, virtual Alaska. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much for having me here uh, today. I, and greetings from Alaska Southeast. I, I hope you stay warm where you are. And, and so the temperature for us here is about 20 today and it's snowy, but so when it's sunny, we have a stunning view of the glacier mm -hmm. and it's a uh, surrounding mountains. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think it's the perfect uh, segue into what I was about to um, to present to you today, um, what um, uh, Elkert, Mr. Elkert uh, was saying about, you know, questioning everything. So that's part of what I'm going to talk about. So uh, for this webinar, I would like to present to you an important part of my research, uh, which is about the Vietnamese transnational anti-war movement during the 1960s and 1970s. Many South Vietnamese immigrants in the U.S. were vocal in their opposition to the war. In this group, it is important to focus on the Vietnamese high school students who came to the U.S. under the auspices of the U.S. Agency for International Development, or USAID, to study in colleges along the West Coast. Even though they were recommended by the South Vietnamese government, um, even though they went through a very strict vetting process to make sure uh, they uh, were not sympathetic to US opponents, even though they were paid uh, by the US government and they were promised important jobs in the South Vietnamese administration upon uh, returning to South Vietnam, despite all that, many of them became activists in the U.S. anti-war movement, thereby risking legal, uh, legal repercussions and losing their scholarships. Um, in time, the students progressed from writing assignments to sit-ins, peace walks, press conferences, and uh, in one case, even hijacking an airplane. Uh, there are three interrelated reasons uh, for their transformation. First, after spending some time in the U.S., they learned important values um, such as free speech, democracy, and uh, civil disobedience. Um, unexpectedly for Washington and, and Saigon, they applied those uh, very uh, values to resist uh, both governments and undermine their agenda. Again, they questioned and started questioning everything. The second reason for their transformation has to do with their exposure to the anti-war movement that made the discussion of Vietnamese history and US involvement in Vietnam front and center. This movement in the US both sharpened the students' concern about US intervention in their country and provided an environment conducive to their nationalist sentiments. And the third reason is 
the global environment that they found themselves in. Young activists in various capitalist countries combined their struggles for civil rights, women's liberation, workers' rights, and gay rights with anti-colonial movements around the world. It was in these historical uh, currents that the USAID students found their, quote, imagined community, unquote, in their quest to end uh, the war uh, in Vietnam and uh, unify the country. Uh, although the transformation of those students in the US was remarkable, they were not alone. Many of their fellow Vietnamese students in France also went through similar changes. The difference is the students in France benefited from an anti-colonial, anti-war um, anti infrastructure that had existed during the first Indochina War, whereas the USAID students in the US did not inherit that tradition. On the screen, um, you, will uh, you will see two items. Uh, the first one is an article in the New York Times about uh, um, the hijacking incident. Um, this was done unsuccessfully uh, by a USAID student. The second one was a letter uh, which was sent to me by one of the USAID students. The letter states that his scholarship was to be terminated and he would be shipped back to Vietnam. It is true that the USAID students were aware of the various movements led by students globally during that time and that they were playing a role in those movements, but they did not know one thing, that the Vietnamese government in North Vietnam or the Democratic Republic of Vietnam also worked very hard at galvanizing the anti-war, anti-colonial sentiments of the global 60s. Hanoi consciously devised and operated a complex and expensive campaign to try to use ordinary people's voices around the globe to oppose US policy in Vietnam. With regards to the US, Hanoi implemented several measures. For example, it invited US activists to North Vietnam or sent delegations to meet uh, to meet with the US activists in Europe, Asia, or Africa, or tried to, to disseminate anti-war literature in the US via mail or personal uh, venues. Although Hanoi did not reach the USAID students directly in promoting the US anti-war movement, it contributed to their rising consciousness. I was introduced to the research about the USAID students by one of my dearest mentors, Professor Ngo Vinh Long of the University of Maine. You can see his photo on the screen. Professor Long was also a student in the US in the 1960s. He received a scholarship at Harvard University and he was not a USAID student, but he worked very closely with them and helped foster their transformation. Professor Long passed away recently and I would like to take this, uh, this opportunity to pay tribute to his many contribution, to con uh, contributions to ending the war in Vietnam and to the scholarship of the history of Vietnam and the Vietnam War. His book, Before the Revolution, was a classic and must read for anyone who wishes to understand Vietnam under French colonialism during the first half of the 20th century. It was first published in 1973 by the MIT Press and reprinted by Columbia University, uh, University Press in 1991. After the end of the war, he continued to, to publish in order to shed light on the conflict. I can think of some of his impo uh, most important contributions in this respect. The first is a chapter entitled The Date Offensive and Its Aftermath, published um, in the book American War by, in Vietnam by Cornell University Press in 1993. And the second is a chapter entitled After Matt Henry, U.S. Policy Toward Indochina Since 1975, 
published in the book, The United States, Southeast Asia, and Historical Memory by Haymarket Books in uh, 2019. I owe much of my academic achievement to the graciousness of Professor Ngo Vinh Long. He not only guided me in my research and provided me with essential contacts in the US, Vietnam, and France, he also, in his quiet way, taught me how to be a humble scholar and a kind human being. Today, in presenting this research, I hope you will join me in honoring his work. Thank you. Sorry, hi. Um, thank you so much. Uh, that was really fascinating, and I'm so interested in reading your book. Um, when it comes out, and um, wish you good luck with that. And um, I, the next, the next person we have coming up, and um, and thank you for the tribute as well. That was lovely. Um, the next person, another really eminent person in this field, is Carolyn Eisenberg. She's a professor of U.S. history and American foreign policy at Hofstra University. Her new book, Fire and Rain: Nixon, Kissinger, and the Wars in Southeast Asia is being published in January um, by Oxford University Press. And I'm sorry, I've been humming that song all day ever since I read this, but I won't right now. Um, her previous books, Drawing the Line, The American Decision to Divide Germany, 1944 to 49, won the Stuart Berth Nath Book Prize and the Herbert Hoover Literary Prize. But she's also been an activist for many years, and she's now the um, she was the co-founder of Brooklyn for Peace, and she's legislative coordinator for Historians for Peace and Democracy. And thank you for your good work, and thank you for joining us today, Carolyn. Um, thank you. Uh, I'm just very interested in um, how you have balanced your life as a historian and a, a um, an activist, and also just uh, I think um, I know you wanted to. You, you had some interest in speaking about something in particular about the impact of the Viet, the Nixon years and the um, impact of the peace movement and interaction between Nixon and the peace movement. And I think that's the thing that I'd love to hear what you have to say about that, since you're an expert on that. Um, is that enough to start with? That is enough, but I am going to slightly change, go back to one sure. of the original questions, if that's sure. okay. Um, but first, I wanted to to thank Chris Abbey, the Department of History at the University of Massachusetts for putting this whole series together and putting this webinar together and inviting me to participate. Um, I'm very grateful for that opportunity. So I have been asked originally um, to describe my experience as an anti-war activist and to keep my remarks within a 10 minute frame. So that was the original task. And so had that task in mind. And on reflection, I realized it would probably take 10 days to cover this. Um, I still remember my first anti-war event, which was picketing Madame New outside the Blackstone Hotel in Chicago in 1963. Um, and one of my last activities, uh, which was to organize a bake sale in Hanover, New Hampshire in 1973, to pay for the reconstruction of Bachmai Hospital, which the American Air Force had destroyed. Um, and in between were countless anti-war activities from marches, sit-ins, meetings that actually never seemed to get over, you never got to the end of these meetings, lobbying, civil disobedience, et cetera. But the important point that I really wanna make is that across this country, there are still tens of thousands of people, now over 60, not 30, over 60, who have memories not so different from mine. That whether they tuned into the Vietnam War in 1963 or 1965 or 1966, um, that once the war on Vietnam entered their minds and their hearts, they never stopped protesting until the American intervention was over. And I had the thought that if we unmuted half the people in this audience right now and said, give us a list of everything that you did back then to get the United States out of Vietnam, we would be here for months. Much of that activity was exhilarating and exciting. You were protesting together with your friends who shared your moral vision and your determination to end or change a horrific national policy that was devastating other people's country. 
and causing immense suffering to our own young men. Um, it's also true that some of that activity was very frightening and very challenging. And the, the film that Judith has made, The Boys Who Said No, reminds us really of the great personal risks that, that many people took in order to end the war. But as the years went by, the levels of our frustration grew. There was a mounting sense that none of our activities were yielding a positive result. Uh, November 1972 was a particular low point. Here's Richard Nixon being reelected by a landslide and a series of national polls showing that the majority of Americans viewed him to be the leader most likely to bring an end to the war. It was horrifying. But this gives me, that gets me to a second question I had been asked which is, and, and this is closer to what Judith was, was getting at at the beginning, which is since I've spent more years than I can count as a professional historian reading the declassified documents of the Nixon administration, how did my discoveries in the archives dovetail with what I and most of my friends in the peace movement thought back then? Well, one thing I didn't find in the archives was one good reason why the United States was heaping destruction on the people of Southeast Asia. If anything, the constant encounter with US policymakers, um, if only on paper and in tapes, made the entire project seem more irrational and morally appalling than I thought in the first place. However, what also emerged from the declassified record is that from 1968 to 1973, the peace movement exerted a significant uninterrupted influence on American policy. In other words, we were more effective than many of us felt at the time. Before going on, I wanted to just quickly mention an important new film, which will be completed later this year, uh, produced by Robert Levering, The Movement and the Madman, which looks specifically at the effect of the 1969 moratorium on President Nixon's decisions in that time period. But speaking more broadly, what did the peace movement actually accomplish? I believe we created the conditions which made it poss impossible for Lyndon Johnson to add more US troops to Vietnam in the aftermath of Tet, which is what our military really wanted. However, with regard to Nixon, which has been my main topic, over four years, we forced the administration to bring the troops home. By November 1972, the numbers had gone from 550,000 to about 30,000, almost none of them combat troops. At the time, neither I nor my friends in the peace movement gave this any credence. These announcements of truth, troop withdrawals that actually make us furious. It's a trick, we said. Nixon's really escalating the war. He's using this, with these withdrawals to conceal his real purpose, and it's morally despicable anyway because all he is doing is changing the color of the corpses. However, when you look at the record, what's crystal clear is that the continued removal of troops, bitterly opposed by Kissinger and the military, unhappily conceded by Nixon, was very consequential. It meant that over time, the United States could not continue the ground war. And since there was little confidence in South Vietnamese fighting ability, no matter how much money and weaponry they were pouring in, and the long-term implication was that the enemy would win. So why did they remove the troops? There's a general answer and a specific one. The general answer is that the peace movement had created an atmosphere in this country in which Nixon needed to demonstrate to the public continuously that he was taking real steps to end the war. And troop withdrawal, troop withdrawal was his way of doing that, month after month. The narrower answer to why this occurred was opposition in Congress. Now, in the corner of the peace movement I inhab inhabited, everybody was disgusted with Congress all the time. Year after year, anti-war resolutions were introduced, eloquent speeches were made, and inevitably the resolutions were defeated and the money kept being appropriated. But there was another side to this, which is the ongoing belief in the White House that if they did not remove the troops, that these, some of these resolutions were going to pass. Not visible to anyone I knew, and not to me, 
the prospect of congressional action was forcing a change in federal policy. Nixon had a phrase for this. We're one step ahead of the sheriff, Nixon would say. Go back to November 1972. Nixon's landslide victory, so demoralizing for everybody in the peace movement, less noticed was that the congressional elections were actually different. In particular, more anti-war politicians were elected to the Senate. And shortly after Election Day, Senators Goldwater, Stennis, uh, and Representative Gerald Ford came to the White House and they told the president, in January, when this new Congress comes in, there will be no more money to pursue the Vietnam War. It was time for the U.S. to sign a peace agreement. Now, one thing Nixon was always good at was counting votes. And his own assessment of the situation on Capitol Hill was the same as these legislators. And after that, he knew he had to actually sign a peace agreement. And I really want to emphasize this, that um, although he authorized the Christmas bombing, which was really designed to maximize the destruction in North Vietnam, to do as much damage before we left. This was done with the full recognition that in January, Henry Kissinger would go to Paris and sign the peace agreement that had been reached in October. I don't want to give this, I'm not, it's not my intention to give this story a Pollyanna gloss. Every day that we in the peace movement failed to end the war was a bad day because more people died. And there's reason to think that some of our own tactics and choices prove counterproductive. But I think it is still important to recognize that because thousands of people all across this country devoted their minds and hearts year after year to the task of ending this war, we finally succeeded in doing so. In ending this talk, it's a particular honor to be yielding the floor to one of the heroes of this story, Daniel Ellsberg. Thank you. Thank you, Carolyn. Exactly my sentiment. I don't, I feel like I need to spend a lot of time introducing Dan, but I just want to say he's my mentor and good friend. And, and I'm always, always happy to be in his presence. Dan is hardly needs an introduction here as the person who leaked the Pentagon Papers in 1971 and really influenced all of us to do what we've done with the rest of our lives. He has continued to get himself arrested as often as possible. I had to, right before his 80th birthday, I said to him, Dan, don't get arrested again in the next three weeks. You have been arrested 70, 80 times, 79 times. I don't want you to get arrested one more time. We want you to be, have 80, I'm sorry, 80 arrests at your 80th birthday. And he went ahead and got arrested again like two weeks later. So he can't be stopped. He is a lifelong activist and a devoted believer in peace and nonviolence and praises to you, Dan. And thank you for, for your um, contribution to this world. Um, I, I guess I, I don't even know if I wanna ask you a question, but do you expect, what, what do you regard as the major successes of the anti-war movement? Um, and what do you think uh, we've learned from the anti-war movement? And I know you could go on forever, but you've got 10 minutes. <laughs> Sorry, I could listen all night. Thank you for being with us, Dan. I would like this program to be available in Russia, which is very unlikely, because who is the audience most needed for, this, for uh, what, we're, what we're hearing here today? And I would say it's the Russian young men and women and older men uh, to try to get some hint as to how they can stop this aggression in Ukraine, which is so comparable, it's more than comparable uh, to American aggression in Iraq, earlier Soviet uh, aggression in Afghanistan. And um, uh, what could they learn about? Because I think I can. I think we can take it for granted that although so far, most of the Russian people seem to have been misinformed uh, so effectively by their government as the American people were effectively misinformed uh, through most of their war, that I am certain that as in Vietnam, there are members of the government as well as in the military, and certainly the people who are facing conscription now, which led to a lot of arrests, thousands of arrests in September. Uh, there are people who are asking themselves, 
how can we end this disaster? And many of them, I'm sure, see it as murder, as I came to do in the question of Vietnam. And they can learn from this program because uh, I'm learning too. Um, actually, each person who's preceded me here raises memories. And I could talk indefinitely about that. I have to mention one, my uh, Bill Earhart, from whom I'm learning so much, uh, very moving from the middle part of his three volume trilogy memoir on the war um, that um, I heard him say today what he believed when he went to Vietnam and when he entered the Marines at 17 about our government. Misbeliefs, he was deluded. And uh, at 17, but that's understandable. I have to say that when I went to Vietnam in 65, I was 34, exactly twice his age. And I was exactly as deluded of the policies of my government and the interests that were being served in Vietnam. And, uh, and after all, what were those interests? I uh, heard from Caroline, uh, from whom I'm learning an awful lot now, right now, about the uh, origins of the Cold War, which are quite relevant to what's going on today, in my opinion, her book about the vision of Germany. But um, when she said that uh, she found no good reasons in all of her historical uh, research for what we were doing, the reason that I put out 7,000 pages, actually 4,000 to the uh, newspapers, uh, but uh, seven, uh, another several thousand to the Center for Relations Committee, which had to do with negotiations. And although I knew negotiations were not going anywhere. They were not in good faith by the United States. I knew that. And that was actually worth exposing, but I didn't want to get in the way of negotiations. I didn't want to have them have an excuse, oh, we've got to break off because Ellsberg has pulled the rug out here and exposed too much. I wanted to get in the way of the war. So in the 4,000 pages, there was hundreds to thousands of pages, which were boring, and uh, I think very few people actually read them, though I had uh, the whole thing. And uh, you could well say, well, why did the public need to know this and this and that? Uh, and the reason I put out every page without changing the line, even the name of a good friend of mine in Vietnam, Lu Kanin, a covert operator, who had, in fact, uh, been participated in the assassination of No Dinh Xiem. Uh, and um, I knew that I'd be accused, of, I thought I would be accused of putting out the name of somebody who might be endangered by this, although it had become public uh, to a specialist who's followed all the literature earlier. And the reason was, I didn't want anyone to feel that I had censored anything from those 4,000 pages because they might think that I had censored out the good reason we were fighting there. And the reason I wanted to put out every sentence and every page was to say, you look at all, search through, didn't have computers then that would, uh, would do that, but you won't find a good reason. You'll find a lot of self-serving reasons and a lot of lies, being, and reasons for lies uh, all the time uh, that were being made, but not a good reason for killing people or sending people to be killed. Now, Take uh, uh, friend Nguyen, uh, Nguyen, uh, Nguyen, Nguyen. <laughs> I did spend time in Vietnam learning how to pronounce that name. Nguyen, Nguyen, okay? You can tell me afterwards, Nguyen, Nguyen. Thank you. <laughs> but um, the, uh, uh, and everything she said was new to so I, I never stopped learning about the war, and I just learned something weird from your uh, from your presentation about the Vietnamese there. But one mistake, I don't want to embarrass you, but uh, not in anything you said, but in one of the slides you showed of uh, Ngo Vinh Long, uh, it said 1965 to uh, 2022. And I looked at that and I thought, that can't be right. I learned a great deal from Govin Law uh, when I joined the anti war movement, essentially in 67, 69. And uh, he couldn't have been seven years old at that time. So I looked him up while you were talking. And yes, he was born in 1994, not 1965. So uh, he, uh, he was old enough by the time of 1969, uh, not just to be uh, 
three years old, four years old at that time. Now, in 69 was, I would say, the most effective action, extremely effective action, far more effective than any of its participants knew, including me. Uh, I was here on October 15th, say at UCLA, with my two young children. And I had started copying the Pentagon Papers on October 1st. And I don't think it was by October 15th, the first moratorium action across the country, that they, that I had got them in to help me for one night, each two nights for my son, one night for my daughter, when they were 10 and 13, uh, because I wanted them to see that I hadn't gone crazy, when, which is what I'm sure they would hear. And, uh, and, and that I was doing something in a business-like way that I thought might help shorten the war. And I wanted to put the idea in their heads uh, that uh, not so much to really to see what I was doing, even to participate in, so that in their lives, they would be burdened by the knowledge that there were times you had to say no to a president and even expose it, resist it, or to the government, uh, the government which was actually so different in interests and nature and policy than Ella Earhart believed at 17, and that I believed at 34. So there were times they had to be resistant. Okay, so the uh, moratorium had been conceived in the uh, late, uh, late spring of 1969 as a general strike. But one of the people backing that uh, felt the older, older man was contributing money uh, so that sounds too radical, a general strike. Hardly ever had a general strike here in San Francisco at one point, and Harry Bridges, I think that was. And it uh, sounds radical. He suggested moratorium, a break in business as usual, stopping of what you're normally doing, is break, like the bank moratorium in 1933. And the idea was very, not fully carried out, very, inventive one, which I, by the way, passed on to Greta Thunberg when I had the honor of meeting her in Sweden. She was carrying out weekday strikes of students, uh, which uh, when I accompanied her on one of those, uh, there was about 70 people. Within a month or two, there was a million. And a year later, uh, many millions around the world of students on a work, on a, not a work day, but a school day, taking off from school, essentially stopping that institution for a day to, to demonstrate against climate emissions. In fact, she just joined a suit of 600 people against her government for not carrying out their promises on the climate. Okay, I, I had the opportunity to say, Greta, in America, we had this project called moratorium. And on the idea was that on the first day called across the country on the same day. Uh, so everybody would be counted across the country as coming out of one day and a work day, a school day, it's a strike. And the, their idea, which I, I wanted to pass on to her and COVID kept her from carrying out this. I don't know if she ever really uh, would have done this in this form, she could have. The idea was on the first day, one first month, one week, and get it right. In the first month, October, one day, 15th, one day off. The next month, November 15th, two days off from work, strike. On the third month, December was to be three days. And actually, Nixon's lies and speech on November 3rd actually convinced so many people that he was going to end the war, as Carol was talking about and take bring troops to home that they had to cancel in December three days. But the uh, Rolodexes, the phone banks actually, the, for the first one they'd organized, still existed, uh, even though officially they closed their main office uh, for the moratorium. So when uh, Nixon invaded Cambodia, uh, these people were all called up and 400, more than 400 campuses closed down. So that was an effect of the moratorium. What nobody knew in October 15th or November was that since August 
actually since May, Nixon had been making threats of nuclear war to North Vietnam. If they didn't meet his terms of pulling their northern troops out of South Vietnam at the same time as we reduced troops here, they never did that. They had no intention that failed. But he was going to escalate the war if they did not agree to that, and he's going to do it on November 3rd. And October 15th, Nixon was faced with two million people on the streets in, uh, across the country, places that had never demonstrated before. It's week workday, remember. And 100 here, 15 there, places, 1,000, 10,000 in places like Los Angeles and even more in, in uh, San Francisco and D.C., adding up to 2 million people, being counted in the big ones by you twos up above. And Nixon said in his memoirs, my threats, explicit threats that he had made to North Vietnam had failed because it was obvious that if he carried out the nuclear attacks and attacks on Laos and Cambodia and North Vietnam that he planned to do, which no one in the movement, including me, had any idea that he was any thought of escalating the war a year after he had been elected on the promise of bringing peace with honor and ending the war. And he looked at that and he said, I would have 20 minutes. He didn't say those so many words. It was very clear. Two million on October 15th, 20 million if he used nuclear weapons, 200. He didn't have 200 million to do it, except that as Cora Weiss said very well in your movie, Judy, very good point. And then the boys who said no, she said, I insist on the demonstrations they held, one of them on November 15th. It had to be an event to which you could bring your children. And people did. And I can say that for years after that I learned about these plans, Codename Duck Hook, to escalate. And that was after the war. I was telling audiences, how many people here put a black arm bind if they couldn't uh, take off work or something, or left work on either on October 15th or November 15th? And for 10 years, many people in the audience would, of course, raise their hands. And I would single out what looked like the youngest, who might be, uh, at this point, this is long after the war, so uh, 20, perhaps 18. I would say, why were you? How were you there? How old were you? And they would say, two, three. They were on their mother's backs, their father's fronts in a basket. They were in a stroller. And I said, you were doing exactly what your parents were doing, exactly what you and your parents should have been doing. You were being counted from you twos in the air, and you were preventing nuclear war, which has gone on till now for another 40 years, 50, 50 years have been added to that. So that was the most effective uh, political action, I think, in history. And I would love the Russians to learn that exact lesson. Thank you, Dan. Thank you so much. And, and you, of course, are, as usual, trying to prevent nuclear war. And I just wanted to mention that Dan and I have been working on a project together that's going to be online in a couple of weeks. So it's actually partially online now at defusenuclearwar.org. And there'll be six soon. There are two now of um, animated podcasts that are taken from a conversation with Dan about um, about um, the new about uh, reducing the risk of nuclear war. Dan was a nuclear war planner before he was a, um, a whistleblower, and he was uh, and he has also written a really important book about nuclear war, the Doomsday Machine: um, Confessions of a Nuclear War Planner. I highly recommend that book to anyone who wants to understand what's the realities of the nuclear threat. Well, I've got a whole bunch of really interesting questions from people here, and I'd love to share them with you all. And actually, while I got Dan, why don't I ask one to you right off? That's a really good question. Which United States president do you think bears the most responsibility? responsibility for the escal escalation and disillusionment of the war? Never really heard an your answer. Well, uh, what you asked, that was to me, I'm sorry. Yes, yes. Yes, what the uh, Pentagon Papers did demonstrate to people was that four presidents 
uh, and you could document this, had lied to the public about what we were doing, why we were doing it, what the prospects of it were, what the deaths and the costs and everything, total lies about everything. And that started with Harry Truman, uh, basically. Uh, FDR had talked about, by the way, had talked about uh, not letting the French back uh, into Indochina because he said they've been there for almost 100 years and the people are less literate than they were before. The, the inequity is even great. They shouldn't be allowed. But before he died, actually, I would have to say this, he had been persuaded that for our post-war uh, alliances with France, uh, we would have to allow them. So Harry Truman didn't invent that idea. We would have to allow them, after all, to get back their former colony. And then Harry Truman acted on that when, uh, when uh, in July, I think it was, of 1945, um, Ho Chi Minh appealed four times in writing for the U.S. to back up the Atlantic Charter and be for self-determination. Uh, of course, when Churchill and Truman um, and FDR had signed that uh, in, during the war for self-determination. Churchill had fingers crossed. There was no thought in his mind that India was going to be allowed independence or any of their colonies. But So that was deceptive right there. But uh, we uh, then Harry Truman uh, definitely backed the French coming back. And above all, after the Chinese communists reached the border um, in 1949, December. At that point, as my friend Bu Van Tai, later ambassador uh, from Vietnam to the US, and later a, co a named unindicted co-conspirator with me uh, on the Pentagon Papers because I had showed him parts of it, uh, which mentioned his name. And he said to me then, at 49, the task became Sisyphean, Sisyphus trying to roll the ball up the mountain, but only to have it come back. Because he said, at that point, with the Chinese communists having uh, won China, uh, controlled in China, at the border, they were now able to su supply and be a sanctuary for the communists in the north. So it became impossible to beat them couldn't win, the French couldn't win, but the US couldn't afford to lose domestically, politically, another area to communism. So a kind of stalemate was determined right then. And that's in, uh, in, four, in late 49. Within a year or so after that, we're paying 80% the cost of the war. So uh, the French were in effect, they were fighting for us as proxies using French bodies in, in, in the French Foreign Legion a lot of former Nazi and German uh, people fighting there in Vietnam. So it was a French-American war at that point. Then Eisenhower, of course, came along, uh, backed, uh, rejected the elections that had been agreed upon by the signers in Geneva in 1954, in 56 elections. We not only supported No Dings Young in refusing them, we picked him because he would refuse them. And we backed him. Had he not refused them, we would have found somebody else. Because, as Dwight Eisenhower said in his words, we knew that 80% of the people would vote for Ho Chi Minh and a unified Vietnam. In other words, from that point on, we knew inside, I didn't know, that we were opposing democratic elections and self determination of Vietnam. And then we get uh, John F. Kennedy, and that's a long story, but he sent, he increased the advisors among uh, who, uh, 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 that had been a ceiling in Geneva. He more than doubled them and eventually led to uh, more than 10,000 advisors there, but still no combat troops. And then it was definitely uh, Nick, uh, I'm sorry, Johnson, when I was working for him in the Pentagon, and I helped him. Against my better instincts, I was against the bombing. My boss was against the bombing, but we worked for McNamara, and we did what McNamara wanted at that point, which was to help get the bombing. I just wanted to say, I am certain there are people in Russia, in the Ministry of Defense and in the military right now, who've known from the beginning, this is a loser, and certainly within a week or two, 
of being their this is a loser. Uh, this we should not be doing this. There are reasons not to do this. Yeah, but they're doing. They're, they're conducting the war, just as we're con we're conducting the support to Yemen right now, knowing that it's the wrong thing to be doing, and so forth. That's how the war. People like me, with all their skepticism, overcome their doubts and their skepticism to keep their jobs and for their career, as I did. So, yeah. and then finally Nixon, of course, uh, who came in to end the war, actually intended to end it by winning it within a year. With escalating and then which was stopped by the moratorium so he wouldn't have wanted it of course Thank not the moratorium you. but there would have been enormously more there yeah that was an incredibly concise history of the vietnam <laughs> war thank you and all the presidents we didn't choose one dan but and i didn't is not yeah. my fortune. i'm sorry if you don't do <laughs> it's all right so i'm just thinking maybe uh maybe a follow-up question or response from no yet when about um the, um, there's a question here about how many years did the USAID program run and what happened to those students after the fall of Saigon? And just curious about, and I and maybe a little bit about it being a French war, if you wanna, that may be too big to tackle, but but these are some something specific here. Um, yeah, thank you for the question. So the um, leadership scholarship program ran for uh, several years. Uh, the first um, uh, cycle uh, was in 1967, was to bring um, uh, um, officers, so soldiers uh, in the, um, the the South Vietnamese um, army to the U.S. And the, uh, the second cycle was to bring high school students. They, they were chosen for their being uh, the best and the brightest. And then the third cycle uh, after them, the uh, next year was to bring uh, war orphans. So um, you could see that they were trying to uh, ensure the loyalty of the recipients of the scholarship. And they were all promised um, that they um, they would, uh, you know, have a good job, or an important position in the you know, South Vietnamese government upon return to Vietnam. Um, and uh, and again, back to the question about, you know, the French, um, uh, you know, entanglement in all this. The reason why the U.S. did that was because the, U, uh, the French infrastructure um, in, in South Vietnam was so entrenched. It was so hard for the U.S. Um, administration to operate there. For example, they have a different system, um, you know, to uh, go to law school, you know, how to operate their, you know, medical equipment, and, you know, accepting doctors and, and volunteers and all kinds of things, um, um, you know, um, that, uh, that made it very difficult for the U.S. to, um, to take over. So that was a joint venture between the South Vietnamese government, who also wanted to get rid of the French influence, and the U.S. government, who wanted to take over. Um, but as of the three uh, cycles that they um, um, uh, that they um, organized, um, the second one, as you can see, the high school students, it was the hardest to ensure their loyalty. And that was the reason why that was in this cycle, uh, because they were just high school students. They were the best and the brightest. Uh, they were not you know, officers in the army. They were not war orphans. Um, the war orphans means that the, you know, the kids with the parents who uh, supposedly were killed by the other side um, uh, in the war. So the, uh, that was the reason why the, um, uh, there were many high school students, uh, the students, um, uh, who turned against uh, the war. And um, even though when I said there were many, there was only a third of them. So um, over 64 of them or 60 of them were sent to the US. A third of them returned to uh, Saigon after uh, they finished with their studies. A third of them became uh, around, a third of them became anti-war activists and a third um, went to Canada. Uh, and after the war, most of them stayed the anti-war activist stayed in the U.S. When I showed the letter of one of the students, uh, uh, you know, who was given the letter telling them that they will be shipped back to Vietnam, that was actually a a, a death sentence because the the Saigon government at the time had said publicly that they would be court-martialed or you know uh, you know be punished uh, 
um, up, upon return. And that's why there was a court case that was really long to make sure that they would stay in this country and not be shipped back to Vietnam. Thank you. Thank you so much. That's very informative. Um, uh, I think this question is for anyone who wants to answer it. And I think Carolyn or, or um, Bill might be the best. Um, to what extent did the US anti-war movement contribute to the ending of the war in Vietnam? And um, I know you've done some specific work in this area, Carolyn, but you've also been a war, an anti-war activist. And, and anyone want to pick that up? Oh, I think you're muted, Carolyn. Yeah. Okay, yeah. No, I think that's the point of my remarks is I think the anti-war movement ended the war in Vietnam. I don't think, um, I think that the whole development of US policy would have been different in the absence of the anti-war movement. I mean, really they have to go back and think of some of the choice points and also think about the growth of the movement. You know, I said in about seven seconds in my remarks, <laughs> I think, for example, a decision that nobody really pays any attention to now, which is after Tet, for example, um, when the military is asking for, I mean, Dan knows this, after, you know, asked for 200,000 more troops, right? Well, Johnson doesn't give it to them. And I know a lot of historians make the point of, well, that's because the wise men all got together and told him not to do it. but behind the wise men was the you know what all the, was a social movement in mm -hmm. other words part of why the wise men you know who had kind of loved the war really at the beginning right part of the why the wise men decided it was wise to start start leaving was because you had a tremendous level of dissent in this country so i mean I, i'm just pointing to one thing but yes i i think that the entire policy of the u.s government from 1967 you know, right up through 1973, I think the whole trajectory would have looked different. And that's also acknowledging that it isn't so great that it took us a long time. But I, you know, I, I still think that's really at the center of this story. Yeah. And at the end, I think there was something that da David Harris says in the end of the most, the voice who said no, <clears> that we didn't end in the way that we had hoped it would, that it was ended because it was just, you know, we just had to leave, but we didn't end on a note of conscience. And just noting that January, this January will be the 50th anniversary of the Paris Peace Agreement. So I think there's going to be a lot of, of celebration of the end of the war. And that should be an interesting period for inter everyone interested. I, you know what I would like to ask if any of you have, since you're all so knowledgeable about this subject, do you have questions for each other? I, I would actually like to address the the anti-war movement and its impact. Um, you know, you're asking for you know what effect did the anti-war movement have? It was very complicated. Certainly, certainly, policy making in the later Johnson years and through the whole Nixon years had everything to do with the fact that there were hundreds of thousands of Americans actively demonstrating against the war. But uh, so what? 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 It certainly changed uh, changed policies, um, but when Nixon shifted to the uh, uh, lottery system of the draft, um, a great deal of the steam went out of the civilian and our war movement. But by 1970 and 71, the driving force of the anti-war movement was guys like me were the anti-war veterans, Vietnam veterans against the war, what Americans were seeing in the news was guys in fatigues throwing their medals over the fence of the Capitol. Uh, they weren't seeing kids getting spit on and that kind of bullshit. Um, so I think that had the veterans themselves not continued to be engaged, even when a lot of the civilians who were no longer threatened were as enthusiastic about pursuing it, but I also think another thing that really is important is uh, that, that the wheels were falling off the US military. In fact, in 1971, there was a Marine Colonel named Robert Heinel who wrote an essay called The Collapse of the Armed Forces in Vietnam. And I think ultimately, 
by 71, the Pentagon went to Nixon and said, if you don't get the army out of Vietnam, you're not going to have an army anymore. Uh, and as much as anything, that had a lot to do with why those ground troops came out of Vietnam. So I just wanted to add that. Dan, did you, I just, and also if you to come back to that question, I'd love to hear if any of you have questions for each other, because I'm sure well, you- Well, I'd like to, could I comment on both of those if I just said, first, I, I agree very much with Bill about the importance, but you know, there are a lot of elements here, uh, no one of which was sufficient to end the war, all of which were necessary. Uh, take, take the Pentagon Papers. Without the people who were going to prison, nonviolently to give the message, to put the question in my mind. Now, having met a couple of them, by the way, one of them was Bob Eaton, I stood in vigil for him during the, the conference, who was in the little clip that you showed. Uh, you know, he happened to be the guy with his legs out uh, Bob Eaton. I stood in a vigil, which to me was kind of like crossing the line in a recruiting station. It separated my life in two parts, as happened the next day, which I also, the factor when Randy Keeler, who's in your film, though not in the trailer, uh, talked about he was going to prison. And I was thinking, all right, uh, we're sacrificing our kids, here, our children uh, in this in this war. And it, it hit me very hard. And it was at that point that I realized that I was willing, like them, to go to prison. And that's what, uh, without them, then no Pentagon Papers. But what difference did that make? The Pentagon Papers release itself got more attention than I could have hoped for, than I had dreamed of, and had no effect on reducing the war or ending the war. Really, no effect. Uh, and when next year, the heaviest bombing of the war, more than a million tons, the next year during the offensive, and then Hanoi bombing in December of that year, people ask me what effect has the Pentagon Papers had? This is a year and a half after they'd come out. I said, no effect, no effect. And uh, uh, the whole anti-war movement, as far as I could see, has had no effect. I was wrong about that. That's the way I felt. Okay, so even later, uh, when the war ended in 1975, not 1973, and Carolyn, I want to discuss that with you, if I may, afterwards, because we did hear a number of times for you when the war ended in 73, as you know, as a, a little slip of the tongue, the war did not end in 73. Mm -hmm. uh, and the refugees kept getting generated, people kept getting killed in Vietnam at the same rate as before, only not Americans. As we said at one point, the point of Vietnamization, sorry to say this, forgive me, but it was an inside term, is to change the color of the bodies. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's what it did to make them exclusively uh, not, not white, as we call white and black. So. The war was not only went on to 75, but it remained a U.S. war. Just as during what we turned to call the French War, it was a French-American war, and this was a two-American war. We were paying all the costs, not 80 percent, 100 percent of the pay of the troops and the napalm and the planes and everything else. It was an American war fought by Vietnamese as is happening right now, by the way, in Ukraine. Is that a purely Ukrainian war at this point uh, with the weapons we're putting over there and so forth, for good or bad? I mean, everyone in the world can see that it's aggression in this case uh, they, by the Russians. It wasn't so clear that it's aggression by the US in Vietnam. And it was in fact pretty clear in Iraq, but most Americans never did get that. So the, however, when we talk about the anti-war movement, which is our subject state, I would have said earlier that the anti-war movement uh, kept a ceiling on the war throughout, at every point um, that it existed, and even after it existed, the shadow of the anti-war movement coming back, kept a ceiling. And I think most Americans, including in the anti-war movement, never really picked up from the Pentagon Papers, which they could have, that, that war was meant by the Joint Chiefs of Staff to be much larger from the beginning, every step of the way. Many we, people in the war movement saw it. They looked at the burned bodies. They looked, how could it be worse than this? We're doing the, the worst we can. 
that wasn't the case. We could have killed twice as many, three times as many, if, as the military put it, they had taken our hands behind our back. And the millions of tons uh, of bombs on North Vietnam and South Vietnam could have killed many more people if the Joint Chiefs had been allowed to do what they were, what they wanted to do. And it was the anti-war movement. Uh, they kept that. Second, getting the troops out. Getting the troops out was, uh, as you say, the anti-war movement plus the veterans bill, plus above all, of course, the bodies, the non-veterans, the ones who didn't come back alive. And, uh, and the draft, uh, putting everybody you know, at risk under this. So all of those things were necessary to ending the war, but not sufficient. And now, Carolyn, I'd like to agree with you on one thing. Getting the troops out turned out to be critical. And uh, because as you said earlier, you were not wrong in thinking that Nixon was keeping support for the war by reducing the number while the war continued. It was his intention to continue the war when all the troops were out. He was going to resume the bombing, uh, absolutely, uh, and carry that on in, as a bombing war in support of the greatly enlarged Vietnamese puppet forces that we were paying. And how long might that have continued, as Bill said, with no Americans being killed, only Vietnamese? Afghanistan finally provided me that answer. 20 years, longer, indefinitely. Biden wasn't forced to pull us out of there by an anti-war movement. He wanted to get out earlier. He, he, he got out quite badly the way we got out of Vietnam, but uh, he didn't have to. We could have been, we could be bombing uh, Afghanistan yeah. this year and next year. So the anti-war movement did, by taking the troops out, last sentence, make it possible for congressmen to vote to end the money for the bombing, which they would not have done otherwise. Up until that moment, when there were troops there that had to be supported, they could not bring themselves to cut off the money. So in that way, too, the anti-war movement made it possible to end the war. This a, thank you, Dan. That was uh, very, very interesting. But I also, there was a question I know, know yet when has, a, has had her hand up and I wanted to see, and someone has asked uh, some questions of her, but I wanted to see what she had to say. Oh, sorry, you're muted. Yeah, I, um, I I think we can spend like a couple hours talking about the role of uh, and how and why the war ended. I just wanted to throw a couple of uh, comments into the mix. Uh, first of all, um, the war ended partly because the Vietnamese did not give up. So they continue to fight and we are looking at at it now from the future looking back we don't know how it's gonna end you know but we know at that point that they did, they did not stop fighting um the other uh, uh comments i want to make is that um that uh, dan you're right uh at the end of the war, they were very worried. I read some material about them strategizing about their next move, and they were very worried. They were watching very closely what the US Congress was going to do about funding. And when they learned that the US would not fund the war anymore, they decided to go all out. So it was that is a role of the NI war movement. But again, it is just what some of the you know side comments into this very complicated question. Thank you. Need to unmute. Sorry. Um, I'm, uh, this question's come up, and it's an interesting one. I think that that people why why is the doesn't the anti-war movement have a more positive reputation in public memory? Do you agree with that? And do you think that? Um, and can you give us any explanation, anyone, Caroline or um, Bill, particularly? Let me yield on that one to to Bill. But but before I do, let me grab the, uh, the non-existent mic. You know, just to say that. <laughs> You know, I mean, I don't have a good answer to that question, but what I would say, you know, is that, you know, when I started my project, um, it wasn't, I wasn't even thinking that I was just writing a book about the anti-war movement, really. I was really trying to understand the whole evolution, and there's also another part that we haven't really talked about and don't have time for, which is relations with Russia and China, and how that fit, you know, into this overall story. 
Um, but what I would say is that it was really when I was reading these records endlessly, I, which I thought of sometimes as hanging out with terrorists, frankly, you know, is that I actually ended up feeling that the anti-war movement was much more important to what happened um, then really that I had even, you know, that I ended up feeling, oh my God, you know, that took forever, et cetera. And of course, Dan's point is right. Uh, yeah, I don't mean to say the war ended in 73. I do see the American role in the war ended. And I also think that that was very consequential. And if I could just sneak in one little point to a question that you were going to ask, but didn't, um, you know, is there anything that surprised you in the record? Sorry, well, lots of things did, but I'll just say the fast one is one of the surprises that I had is that the anti-war movement and all the surrounding, by the end, Richard Nixon hated the war. I know there's a lot of left historians that would say he would have gone on for eternity. Yeah. I read that record, he's sick of it. He feels like this has ruined his presidency. He wants it over. And that was something I really didn't think. Success, yes. Bill, did you have something quick? I think we just have a few minutes and I just want well, to say well, thank uh, I'm getting used to doing stuff in sound bites. Um, basically, most Americans, not me. <laughs> opposed, most Americans who opposed the war, who, who came to, to not support the war in Vietnam, didn't do so because it was morally wrong that this industrialized nation was dropping bombs on peasants. And uh, it was because what they were seeing on television uh, jet fighter planes dropping bombs on water buffalo, it, dis it disturbed their sense of who we are as a people. They had to look at the reality of what it means to be an American, and they wanted it to stop. They wanted it to go away and end the nightmare. But once it did, over the course of 10 years, going into the Reagan administration, um, it was very easy to con the American people into forgetting the reality of the war and molding the Vietnam War into um, the, 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 the fitting the framework of, of the United States and what we think of ourselves. I mean, look at Ronald Reagan, September 1980. Um, it is time for us to admit that ours in truth was a noble cause. And everybody in America went, wow, yeah, that's great. And of course, the image of veterans throwing their medals away was replaced by the non-existent mythology of the anti-war movement abusing the veterans and spitting on them. I mean, look, two million people in Georgia voted for Herschel Walker. You can't really expect the American people to <laughs> see all that. that. That's a great place to end, Bill. Uh, and we do have to end. And I just wanted to ask to, to thank Chris Abbey and, and Jessica and, and the everybody at University of Massachusetts and so thrilled that there's going to be an institute honoring Daniel Ellsberg there and all of you have been fabulous and I feel very honored to spend this time with you and and it's been I've learned so much thank you and Chris are you coming back on or is that the end I really um wanted uh just to say goodbye to everybody and I uh, thought it'd be nice. thank, to thank you all it was a great panel discussion it will be starting up with new programming in late February. So stay tuned. Thanks to all. Good night. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. Appreciate it.